And is that not the, really the cry of our heart? Really the, the longing of, of what we are about to have the Lord abide with us and us to abide in Him? It's a great way to introduce our text this morning. We'll be in James chapter 5. It's the last part of James. And it's a, an important place for us to go because it deals with, of course, prayer. Ever been surprised in prayer before? Like, I mean, you asked for something and then God actually did that thing that you asked? I, mean, I, always, I always wonder, like, why am I so surprised? Like, I asked God for this and then he did what I asked and yet I'm surprised that he, in fact, gave me what I asked. It's amazing. You know, we, we do, and I've been this is guilty of that. We have so many of these half-hearted, weak-in-the-flesh kind of prayers that say, well, God, I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to pray this. I'm supposed to give this to you. And so I'm going to do that, but in my mind, I go, well, I don't, it's not really going to happen. Like, this isn't really going to take place. If I'm honest, I'd say I've done that before, and if, I'm, if you're honest, you probably have done the same. And I feel sometimes like the blind men in Matthew chapter 9 where, where they follow Jesus into that room, remember? And, and um, he looked at them and he says, do you believe that I am able to do this? And do you believe I am able to do this? Jesus has asked me that many times. And of course, I, yes, I believe, but do I, do I really believe that you're able to do this? And isn't that the key to prayer, really? I mean, there's that idea that, <clears throat> that we are going to a God who can actually do something about whatever it is that we are asking him. That, that he's actually able to interact and do something. Not some formula or routine. Uh, I've said this and therefore God's going to do this. No, it's, it's faith. And this idea of prayer that stems from a faith that says, God, you are able. That Jesus, yes, I believe you are able to do this and you care for me. Among the masses of humanity and the complexities of humanity and all the different issues we deal with, that you care, that you love me, you desire to walk with me. A praying faith. Praying is a word that we use. Prayer is a word we use a lot. We talk a lot about prayer. Uh, hopefully we are people who spend some time in prayer on our, on our own. But prayer means more than just wishing. It means that. It means asking. It means petitioning. All those things. But there's also this idea in prayer that it's, it's also the idea that we obtain good and avert evil. That when we are praying that God is giving to us good and that we are also seeing him avert evil or, or take care of the evil in our world. And that is really significant if you think about that. That we have access to, to God immediately. That we can go into his throne room and in, in very literally and walk in there and, and pray and talk to him and have a relationship with him. That he can do something in your circumstance right now today, no matter what it is. He doesn't need anything else. He's got everything that he needs contained completely in him to, to act on your behalf, on the behalf of your loved one, to give you good or to avert evil. It's exciting. The concern, of course, can be overwhelming. Uh, we can have all kinds of things that we deal with that say, man, this is, this is big. I mean, yeah, you're a big guy, but this is big. But he's God. And he's big. Bigger than that. Or the concern might be too small, you think. Well, you know, you're God and you're busy with other things. And this little issue I got, well, I'm not going to... It's just a small thing. But He is loving and compassionate and merciful and He cares for you. It's exciting to know that there is no detail in all of creation that He is unaware of. In all of creation. He knows everything. He sees everything. He's not... Uh, unaware, And so we can be confident in prayer that we can actually go to him and, and pray for big things. Like that time Jesus said that you know, faith can move mountains. Like pray for the big things. Why not? He's God, right? I mean, why not pray for big mountain moving type things? Why not pray that God would start a revival in America again? Why not? Why not? Why not pray that, that he would fill the churches with hungry hearts ready to learn and hear and grow and that the addictions that people are dealing with would be torn down and the sinful bondage that so many find themselves weighed down by would be gone. Why not pray that way? Why not pray for healed marriages and mended brokenness? And I mean, we, all kinds of things we can pray for. 
We should be praying that way. And that's where James takes us today. This last part of this series, Faith in Real Life, is faith that is a praying faith. A faith that prays, that looks to God, that looks like someone who is desperate for God, that says, God, I need you. I need you in every way, every moment, everything. And I ask you to work and move and power on my behalf and on behalf of people that I love, people around me, my community, my world. And why not? He's God, after all. James chapter 5, we'll read this now starting in verse 13 and through the end of the, the entire uh, letter here. James 5, starting in verse 13. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers, if any one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Faith in real life is a praying faith. And <clears throat> you see God working powerfully through ordinary people. He's, he mentions Elijah in the middle of this, and he does it on purpose because it would have been something they would have been familiar with. Elijah was a, just an ordinary guy who was used by God. He prayed, and God used him for some incredible and exciting things. He had no inherent power on his own. He didn't have some sort of schooling that made him better at uh, all these things. He just was a person who relied wholly on the power of God, and he prayed, and God acted. Nothing given to him, nothing that he did not receive, I should say nothing given that he did not receive from God. So here's our example then, that each one of us, no matter who we are, no matter if we went to school or not, or you know, you're a pastor, you're not a pastor, that any of us, all of us can be people who pray earnestly. And it's because it's who we pray to, it's not because of how we do that, because it's God. So we're to be people of prayer. This last part of this letter, James asked some questions, and the questions actually uh, hit any one of us, no matter where we are in our life, in some way or another. Uh, questions about every person that we find ourselves, either you're in trouble, or you're happy, or you're sick, or you're burdened with a sinful, wandering heart, or you're in any number of places along that journey. But no matter who you are, you've been there, or you're there, we've experienced it in some way in our life. And so we are to pray. Pray, he says. So what does he tell us? There are a couple different areas here. One, he says to pray in times of trouble. First verse right there. Anyone you in trouble? He should pray. It starts with individual prayer. That I would pray for myself, that you would pray for yourself when you are in trouble. Trouble can be all kinds of things. It's very vague. Trouble uh, is all, I mean, it's nothing too big, nothing too small, nothing too uh, difficult. Trouble is very vague on purpose because, of course, we have all kinds of trouble. We don't need any help finding it, I don't think, do we? It seems like it's always there, ready to find us. Back in Isaiah chapter 30, in verse 15, I'm going to read a couple of verses. There's no slides for this. Just listen to this because it hits very well with a time of trouble and how the Lord likes to act in a time of trouble. Isaiah 30 and verse 15 <laughs> this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. You said, we will ride off on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee. At the threat of one, at the threat of five, you will all flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. So you hear what God's saying. God is saying that you know you've got some trouble and you are trying to handle it on your own. <laughs> trying to do your own thing to fix your own problem. And he says, if, if you would just ask, 
I would help you. I would give you a solution to your problem, but you don't ask. You do it yourself. You just kind of uh, fix it on your own. I think we have probably all done that before. Let me, try, let me just try this first, God. I can do this on my own. And we get in some big trouble. We run so fast that we fall very hard. You ever watch a, a young child run down a hill? Isn't it like, like the most terrifying thing you ever saw, seen in your life? You know, because they're like, oh, just please don't fall. You know, they just run and then the little feet just go faster and faster down this hill and, and before too long, you know, the, the head gets too far ahead or something happens and they trip and they fall and they skin their knee and hurt their head and all that stuff. And it's just terrible for us to watch because we know it's going to happen. See, I think that's what happens to us in our own life as well. We start to kind of move ahead and we start to move down this path and down this hill and we start moving a little faster, a little faster and I've got this, I can handle this and before too long, it's, we're going a little too fast and a little bit in trouble, starting to trip, lose our step and before you know it, we go down. But listen to this. Chapter 30, verse 18, he says, Yet... The Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for Him. You see that? That the Lord is, that He longs to be gracious to you. I mean, yes, you've tried your own thing. Yes, you've struggled on your own. Yes, you're in trouble and you haven't learned your lesson yet. But the Lord longs to be gracious to you. And I wonder if you might need to hear that today. Because the world is always picking on us, isn't it? I mean, it's always picking at everybody else. And there's some reason or another why I feel like I've messed up. And I feel like I've not done enough. But the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. When times of trouble come, we are to go to Him first. That we are to, to bring it to Him instead of trying to fix it ourselves. Instead of trying to, to run forward on our own. Because the Lord longs to show up in our situation. He longs to do something in your life. He, he wants to. That's what it says. He longs to be gracious. He wants to show His grace in your life. We've got to let Him and allow Him and ask Him to do that. He gives in time of trouble out of that compassion, out of that mercy. And it says you are blessed as you wait on Him. I mentioned Syria <coughs> earlier. Interesting thing is when you hear about the reports going on, uh, in Syria, for example, people running for their lives out of the country for years. It's been going on for a few years now, for a while. And, uh, and the world tries to figure out what to do with all these people as they leave. Well, interestingly enough, in Syria today, there are still 18 evangelical churches. And in those churches, even though 50% of the people have left the country, and only half of them remain, the church is overflowing with people. People who are desperate for hope because they see the hostility and the violence and they say there's got to be something better. There's got to be some other way than this way of hatred and, and fear. And the Lord is answering prayers of those in trouble. He's answering the prayers of people who go to Him in trouble. Violence has brought a desperation, but God is working. And so we ask the question to you, are you in trouble? No, you're not running for your life. We're not in a civil war or whatever in this country, but are you in trouble? Have you prayed about it? Have you asked the Lord? Have you gone to Him? Are you, it, not just the kind of trouble, by the way, that says, well, I did something wrong and I hope they don't notice. Nobody ever did that as a kid, right? You didn't break something, mom and dad, and uh, hope they didn't find out that you broke it. Remember my, I'll pick up my brother because I never did anything wrong, of course, but uh, yeah. <coughs> it's not true. You can ask him sometime if he comes. <coughs> Excuse me, but my brother, uh, my parents had just got this new countertop put in and uh, he decided he was going to take a piece of cardboard and he was going to take a scissors and put holes in the cardboard on the new countertop and, you know, and guess what happened? <clears throat> there were holes in the countertop. Now that will make you pray, believe me, okay? That will make you a person of prayer. You are in trouble. But there's other kinds of trouble as well. How about anxiety? How about low self-esteem? How about pressures to be or do something you don't want to be or do? <coughs> Excuse me. How about bills that need to get paid? How about mouths need to be fed? How about uh, sicknesses and all kinds of stuff that we deal with brokenness? I mean, do you ever just walk around the world in, in places and just feel the brokenness? 
We just watch the news, feel the brokenness of the world, and just go, wow, God, we just, if we would just go to you, what a difference it would make. Because he longs to be gracious to us, to you, to, to the world. But we don't want to ask. <clears throat> and so James says, any of you in trouble? He should pray. But he goes on. He says, well, what about times when we're happy? What about times when things are going pretty well? Pray in times of happiness as well. He says in verse 14, is anyone of you sick? Or no, sorry, verse, verse 13. Any, let any of you happy, let him sing songs of praise. There's this sense of this overflowing praise out of this life that says, I've gone to God in my trouble, and he's answered me in my trouble, and it's <clears throat> this just amazing time that I can be happy and I can praise him just because he is God. We can just praise his name. <clears throat> There's an example. If you go through the, the Psalms of David, and you see this pattern, David is always praising God, and he's kind of wailing and upset and grieving, and then he praises God again. He always kind of ends in this place of praise. His hands raised and then his hands open in worship. It's a powerful story. You, you know the story. You probably read through some of the David's psalms before. But remember, David is running for his, for his life from his father-in-law. I mean, most of us don't have that kind of a problem with their in-laws, right? But <clears throat> his father-in-law is after him to try to kill him. So he goes to the desert. Desert is normally where criminals hide. David is out in the desert hiding from his father-in-law. And he's in these caves, and he's out there, and he's just praying to the Lord, Lord, please do something on my behalf. Please, would you show up and, and give me uh, what I need? He says, I'm thirsty, and I'm literally thirsty, and I'm also thirsty for you to, <clears throat> to do something. <clears throat> um, Psalm 42 says this, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? And so you get that literal sense of thirst, but he says, boy, this physical thirst reminds me that I'm thirsty for you, God, and that I'm in trouble, and I've seen your goodness, and I want to worship you. And then he ends this psalm in verse 11, where he says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why is it so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my God, my Savior, and my God. And so these prayers, it takes him through this struggle, and he gets to the place where he goes, man, I just I praise you again. And so if we're happy, we praise, sing songs. Remember, <clears throat> when I was on the Cape, there was this guy whose daughter was dying of cancer, and she eventually died. She was like 30 years old when she died. And uh, for years, they struggled with this. And he says, you know, as much as he hated to see, of course, his daughter die that way, he was really grateful for the Lord's presence in the midst of it. And he said, you know, the Lord taught us how to lean. He taught us that he was present in our suffering. He gave us a joy that we would not have known had we not gone through the time of trouble. Found rest in that living God. And so the encouragement here is in this is not just to come to church when you are having a hard time, but come to church when you are happy as well. So you can praise His name. Sing songs of praise. Let your mouth speak the wonder and glory of God. Be a blessing to others. Let him, if any one of you happy, let him sing songs of praise. Now, up until now, we've focused on ourselves. Individuals, that if I'm happy, if I'm sad, if I'm in trouble, I pray. <clears throat> now we go to kind of an expansion of that to the body of Christ. You and, you and me, as we come together and we work to live together and fellowship and <clears throat> together, that we would pray for each other. That really the highest ministry of prayer is not just that me and, and God, but that we would pray for one another. Lift each other up before the throne. Verse 14 says, Any one of you sick, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. So we are to pray in our times of sickness. Now the sick person has a role in this. The, the role is to let the elders know so they can come and pray. Now the elders serve as shepherds uh, in the church. Jesus is, of course, the good shepherd. He is the healer. But as elders in the church, God uses them as people who are able to uh, minister as, as an under-shepherd, if you will, that he would ordain and, and allow us as shepherds to watch over and take responsibility and love and pray for his people. But God works through his people, and that's what's exciting. 
that he allows us to pray for each other and then he works as a result of that prayer. That he does something as a result of the prayer. And so the physically sick or the spiritually sick are to call on the elder who are, it says here, to anoint <clears throat> with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, a couple things just to make mention of here. The oil, for example, is uh, probably olive oil. It had medicinal purposes, okay? So they used it medicinally. However, this has much deeper meaning than just, oh, I hear some medicine for your illness. This is a symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit, of His work. It helps the sick person focus. So if you put a little oil on somebody, it helps us, if we're sick, to focus on the presence of God and to say, Lord, I long for you to, to do something in my body because it's very hard to focus when we're sick. The oil serves as a symbol of God's care, of God's comfort, of God's joy and mercy. And it stirs us, if we are sick, to remember the mercy of God. And it's also something that is done, it says, in the name of the Lord. So it says at the end of that verse, in the name of the Lord, meaning that the oil also is a sense that we take someone and we put a little oil on their head or wherever and we set them apart and say, God, we're setting this, part, this person apart before you so you can then do something in them. It's symbolic that way and that it's helpful to help us rem remember that the Lord is the one who does the work. The Lord does the healing. It's not magical oil. It's nothing we're doing. It's, it's the Lord's work. <clears throat> and remind us to focus on Him. So we follow this model today. We've, we've done that since I've been here a number of times. And again, if you have an illness and you would like us to pray for you that way, we'd be glad to do that. We follow the Lord and then we watch for how the Lord ministers through that and how He answers that prayer. And it's not always how we expect <laughs> and what we want, but we also trust in Him to know what is best for us. So the elders then is a channel of God's work calling us to do that. In verse 15 it says now, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he'll be forgiven. Okay, challenging verse. Challenging verse. And uh, there's a lot there and there's a lot of misconceptions on that and misrepresentations of that. Um, the first is that if it, it says the prayer offered in faith will raise the sick person. Now, does, does that mean if I believe really, 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 really hard that God will answer my prayer? that God will heal me. There are times, of course, God does that. And there are times when He doesn't answer how we expect. So does that mean that if, if I don't get what I've asked for in prayer, if I've gone and I've prayed and I've not received my healing, that I am low on faith, that I need to have more faith. I need to somehow find more faith in order to get what I want from God. The problem with that is it's inconsistent with the rest of the Bible. Faith obviously has a part to play. Okay, I'm not saying faith is, faith is significant, faith is important. But Jesus said that faith the size of a mustard seed could move a mountain. So it's not so much a measure as much as it is that we have faith. And we come to the Lord in prayer and that demonstrates faith. And of course we need to be encouraged and increase our faith and look to Him in all things. But if we look at to our faith level as an indicator of how God's going to work, then we're looking at us and not at Him. And this is all about what he wants to accomplish. It says in verse 16, the prayer of a, of, a, of a righteous man is powerful and effective. You know why it's powerful and effective? Because of God. Not because this righteous man is so righteous and good and perfect, but because God is gracious. Because God answers the prayer and God does it in power. So this is about the sovereignty of God, that we rest ourselves in that sovereign hand of God to say, God, I, I believe, I trust you, and whatever you want to do in me, I'm okay with. Whatever that is. Because I believe that you know what you're doing, and, and you are God, and I'm not God, and, and that's okay. Remember Paul. Paul says, Paul says that he prayed three times for that thorn to be removed in his flesh. Are we saying to Paul, Paul, you need a little more faith, I think. Did you increase your faith, Paul? No, it wasn't what it was. Remember what, what, uh, what he said. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And so God's saying, hey, my plan for you is to give you grace so that you can walk through this faithfully and you can boast in your weaknesses because of the power of Christ in his life. So maybe what you need is grace, but we don't always know and we ask. And we get the glory, God gets the glory as we bring our sicknesses before him. He also mentions sin here, and of course there was times in the New Testament where we see that, where someone had sin and then they were punished for their sin with an illness or something. 
And then there are times when not. Remember the guy in John chapter 9, the, the, the boy born blind, and the disciples say, hey, who's sinned, this man or his parents? That he was born by Jesus says, neither one. But this is so that God's glory, God's work could be made known in his life. And so again, we, we don't get the sense here that if you're sick and you've prayed and you've not been healed, that maybe it's because you have some sin. Maybe you do, but maybe it's just because that God has a different plan and a different way he's going to work in you. But we've all heard people kind of use that and, and twist that. So we've got to look at the whole of Scripture is what my point is. You can't just take a verse and take a couple of words and say, oh, that's what it is, but you've got to look at what God is saying in the entire revelation of his word and see how God works. So, Jesus, he died on the cross. He paid for your sin. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you have trusted in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. There's no condemnation, it says. So to, to say it's your fault that you are sick will put you back under that condemnation. So he's paid for it in full. Now, last part then is, is about sin. He talks about sin here. So we pray in sickness, happiness. Uh, we pray if we're in trouble. We also pray in times of sin. He talks about uh, wandering and confession. Verse 16, we see uh, if you can confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. A demonstration of, of body life because when, our, when we sin, our natural bent is not to go to our brother and sister and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. But our natural bent is to isolate, run away, hide, not come to church, not be a part of fellowship because I don't want to, I don't want to, I just, I just don't want to do that. I feel bad about what I did. But that's not what he's, that's not what we're supposed to be doing. See, part of body life is coming and praying with brothers and sisters, praying with each other and, and not hiding because there's healing in that. There's healing when we pray for each other. We all struggle at different points. We all need each other. That's what the church is about. We're, we're not perfect. We haven't figured it out yet. We, we need each other. We need this constant fellowship and, and time in His Word. Verse 19, he says, If any of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover a multitude of sins. And wander is a pretty good picture because when we uh, drift a bit from truth, kind of wander a little ways, we need to be brought back. It's small changes that take us far away from God. If you've ever been uh, out on the water in the wind without some way to move your boat, <laughs> you, you know you're kind of at the mercy of the breeze, right? And, and if we get caught in the breeze of culture and the, the winds and the things that are going on in the world, we just kind of blow around. But we need that momentum of faith, the momentum of God's Word, the people around us to help encourage us. Say, hey, come on, kids, keep moving forward. Let's keep going in the right direction. Let's, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to do some work in us because we cannot do it on our own. In the uh, hymn, Come Thou Found, it says, Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee a fetter is like a, a chain so like when you put a chain on yourself to chain yourself to, like a prisoner to the wall or to a weight or something so they can't move so think about that let thy goodness like a fetter like we are chained in a way to the goodness of God that keep us from wandering but oh how hard is that to do we, we can't do it on our own just, we just need each other we need help doing that. We need help reminding the goodness of God, remembering it, and what a difference it makes to follow Christ and to live a different way, to live a life-giving, purposeful way and to say, Jesus, I need you and I'm not going to follow that or this. I'm going to follow you and I'm going to help my brother and sister do that and they're going to help me. It goes both ways. It's not like, oh, you did this wrong. No, it's, it's, it's us together. Fellowship, encouragement, brothers and sisters keeping each other on the path we need to be. It's part of what we do as a church. So I pray that we stay true. I pray that we love each other enough to walk in trouble and sickness and sin and happiness, to walk with each other, to walk and pray together. And so like I said before, no matter who you are, you might be in trouble, you might be happy, you might be sick or in sin or wherever. Somewhere in there, you're there today, somewhere. But no matter where we fall, the action is still the same. Go trust in the Lord. Put your life in the hands of Jesus. 
That's the answer to all of this. We settle on the sovereign nature of God and say, God, you are God, I'm not God, and I'm going to trust you, I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to allow you to do your work, no matter what that is, and I'm not going to uh, try to change it. I'm just going to ask you to, to minister and be gracious to me and work through me, and that whole idea of thy will be done. That we be able to pray that and say that and mean that. So where are you at in that today? The answer is the same. Go to Jesus. Take it to Him in prayer. Let's pray. God, we are just as guilty as these guys were of trying to do things on our own and trying to find our own purpose and meaning and way and trying to run ahead of You. And, and yet You call us to be people who pray, who come to You, who abide with you, who walk with you, who say, Lord, you please speak into this. Please be gracious to me in this. Each of us have things in our hearts today that we are looking to you for. And Lord, sometimes we pray, it seems like for, for a long time, and we don't get the answer we hope for. And so help us in those moments to, to trust in you, to have faith in you, to believe that you are our God who has a plan and purpose that is better than I can see. And Lord, for those times when we're happy, help us to be people who rejoice and who praise you in song and who, who just live that out and encourage our brothers and sisters to walk faithfully with you, Lord, how we need each other, how we are desperate to uh, stay true in a world that wants to pull us away. But Lord, I pray that you would increase our level of prayer, each one of us in our lives and in our church family, that we would be people who go to you first, that we don't jump ahead, but we walk in your spirit and we say, Lord, what do you want for us to do? And we, we take that step and, and we take the next step and we just keep moving in the direction you want us to. Help us to have a praying faith, a faith that demonstrates itself through how we pray and how we seek. But I ask you to do that in our lives. For those today who are struggling, I pray that you would provide comfort and hope. For those who are wrestling with sin, I pray that you, Jesus, would minister Speak into that to the point in, that we would realize again that you have forgiven us on the cross, that our job is to trust and accept you as our Savior, as our Lord, to put our hope and our life completely in your hands because we, on our own, cannot earn salvation. We can't forgive ourselves. We need you to do that. Encourage, equip, and move us in your direction, we pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.